So I'm one of the thoracic and lung transplant surgeons at Toronto General, um, and my disclosure is that I have no disclosures. So unlike a lot of my partners, I have no EVLP research background. Um, my only um, experience with EVLP is really from the clinical setting. Um, so I take a bit of a different perspective um, than my partners who've extensively been involved in the research. But as we know, donor lung utilization is low. So across all sort of solid organ groups, um, there's a, a low utilization, but especially for lung. And um, you know, we only use about 20% of lungs for transplant. And as we know, this is a problem because every year we still have patients dying on the wait list. And this is due to a number of factors, but um, you know, a, a lot of it has to do with the insults that the donor lungs sustain when they're um, in ICU due to multiple different things. Um, you know ventilator-associated lung injury, fluids, clots, um, and this all activates this inflammatory cascade and, and creates this problem of primary graft dysfunction after transplant. And any transplant surgeon knows uh, what a problem this is. So, you, you know, everybody sort of dreads that x-ray when you take the patient up to the ICU postoperatively. Um, and the reason why it's such a problem is that it really impacts survival. So you can see that survival for PGD3 is uh, worse than uh, for no PGD or for early stage, early grades. So the normal th thermic uh, ex vivo lung perfusion, um, it's this uh, new technology. It's not so new anymore, but um, it's been implemented and started to better assess and treat donor lungs. Um, so, you know, it provides multiple opportunities to um, assess lungs that were previously declined because of concern about function or quality. Um, diagnose problems in the lungs, and the, the whole goal of this is to improve utilization of these marginal lungs. It also provides other options to treat, recover, and repair with targeted therapy. Um, and then it also allows this unique opportunity to assess the results of treatment. So you can treat the lungs and then assess and see how well the treatment has worked. So this is our Toronto EVLP circuit or protocol. Um, it's, uh, we, you know, the same. We've been using it for uh, quite a few years now. Um, and this was one of the papers published early on in 2008. Um, and our uh, circuit is based and in, in uses sort of an ECMO pump, ECMO circuit uh, um, format. And there are some commercially available devices. So you can see these are two examples here. And this was one of the uh, first papers and the, the you know, major paper we published on EVLP and clinical transplantation um, back in 2011. And this really established the fact that EVLP is safe and can sustain donor lungs. Um, and from there, we've really expanded um, what we use EVLP for and the uh, potential um, uh, yeah, uh, research, et cetera, with it. So this was the first clinical EVLP case. It was done in 2008. Um, and the donor was a 20-year-old male, so you know, presumably previously normal lungs, but sustained a trauma, a multi-vehicle collision, a significant blood transfusion, um, low PO2, so below that 300 threshold that we always look for. Um, chest X-ray showed pulmonary edema, and the bronch showed significant bloody secretions. So this is the chest X-ray. And so our protocol for EVLP, we, we uh, assess the lungs at hourly intervals. We do x-rays at one hour and three hours, and then decide at three hours usually if we're going to proceed. Um, so you can see the first x-ray at one hour. There's significant edema. It looks very abnormal. PF ratio is only 250. But as the lungs stayed on the circuit, um, at three hours, the x-ray was much better. PF ratio was much improved. And so we proceeded to transplant. And this is the post-op x-ray when the patient ended up in ICU. This is actually the patient. Uh, this picture was taken three months after his transplant, and that was 10 years ago, and he's still doing really well with essentially normal lung function. So this really was a success. And we've noticed a major change in our program um, after the implementation of EVLP. So you can see in the yellow bars, um, EVLP first started in 2007, 2008, sorry, and um, uh, it was you know, small at first, but it's really sort of exploded. Uh, we've done over 500 clinical EVLPs up to date. Um, and we've had an essentially 100% increase in our transplant rate. So whereas um, we were doing 100 transplants back in 2007, 2008, we're now up to 200 lung transplants per year. And we looked at the reasons for EVLP. So what are our indications? What are the subgroups? And there's sort of four groups that we identified. So the first group is the high-risk brain-dead donors. The second is the standard DCD donors. The third is the high-risk DCD donors. And the fourth is group for logistics. Um, and the 
utilization rates for each of those groups increased, or sorry, the, the use of EVLP for each of those groups increased over the years, um, and there wasn't any significant differences in utilization between the groups. You can see lowest for the, uh, the high-risk DCD donors, highest for the logistics, but um, you know, no significant differences. And in looking at our survival, so this is our overall survival for our entire cohort of patients from 1983 to 2018. Um, and in green is the EVLP group, uh, and there's no difference in survival um, compared to non-EVLP in the entire cohort. So you know, initially we used uh, EVLP for assessment, um, but there's also a, a lot of other opportunities for using EVLP uh, for preservation of the lungs, for treatment, and for repair of the lungs. So as I mentioned, there's sort of four indications that we typically think of for EVLP. Um, the unusable or high-risk donor lungs. So these are the lungs that previously would have been declined, like the first donor I presented, probably would have been declined due to multiple concerns. Um, and these are the lungs that really are um, uh, the ones that we're placing on EVLP and um, assessing and treating. The second is the standard risk DCD. So there's a controversy about this, whether or not all DCD donors should have EVLP. Um, you know, I know there's programs where they do DCDs and don't have EVLP. Um, our program, it's, um, it's really surgeon preference. So we have eight surgeons, uh, and each surgeon will decide whether or not uh, they want to put the lungs on EVLP, um, depending on, you know, the donor factors, the warm ischemic time, et cetera. There's also the extended um, criteria um, uh, DCD donors, um, and then also for logistics, um, which is um, we're using sort of more and more. So in terms of the unusable or high-risk donor lung, so what makes it unusable or high-risk? So there's multiple factors, uh, pulmonary edema, pneumonia, aspiration is pretty, a pretty common problem. You know, we often get histories that say donor aspirated, or the, you know, the patient aspirated when they were found, or DCD donors are aspirate uh, with withdrawal of life support. Massive pulmonary emboli is another indication and previously would be considered an unusable lung. Chronic viral infection, so um, we'll talk more about this. This is becoming very common. Um, and then also the long, warm ischemia time in controlled and uncontrolled donors, so DCD donors. So um, usually if we have a DCD donor, sort of the unwritten rule is if it's less than 30 minutes uh, between withdrawal of life support and cardiac arrest, then um, we don't necessarily use EVLP, although sometimes we do, um, but for sure for the longer, warm ischemia times we do. And again, there's different treatment strategies. So um, treatment with medications, um, treatment with just the perfusion, and some of these we're doing already. Um, but a lot of these are uh, investigational and um, in ways in which we can uh, further the use of EVLP. So in terms of pneumonia, so um, this research is done, uh, was done in Marcello's lab. And um, basically what they did was they looked at um, treating the lungs on EVLP. And these are often pig models that they use. Um, and uh, to see what effect it had on the lungs. So they treated uh, the lungs with meropenem and they treated with the, them with vancomycin. And you can see that there is a significant decrease in the bacterial counts um, during the EVLP um, that went to 12 hours, so longer EVLP that we would obviously use clinically. But interestingly, also, they found that there was improved lung function. So as the bacterial counts decreased, the lung function of the lungs on the circuit actually in improved. And um, you know, they really were able to repair these lungs by treating the problem. Again, aspiration is a common problem um, and really limits the, uh, can limit the use of the donor lungs. Um, and they similarly looked at a model, um, an aspiration model on pig lungs, and um, they looked at four different groups. So the control group, where they just perfused them, lavage group, uh, surfactant, and surfactant and lavage. Um, and what they found was that there was actually a significant improvement in the group that had surfactant and lavage. Um, so really were able to repair these lungs. This is one of my cases, and uh, you can see that's a horrible bronchoscopy. It looks just awful. Um, and it, the parenchyma was perfect, though. So the lungs flushed well. The PO2 was or PF ratio was great, um, but you know we obviously wouldn't go straight to transplant with these lungs. So we put them on the circuit. Um, this is an obvious aspiration, but not aspiration pneumonia uh, because the lungs actually perform very well on the circuit, and we were able to transplant them with no problem. So, you know, obviously we would never have done this if we didn't have EVLP, um, but it really allowed us to um, use these lungs that we would otherwise have declined. PE is another reason. So, you know, it's pretty common to see small clots when you flush, either anterograde or retrograde. Um, but this was a donor who actually died of a massive PE. Um, donor had a history of thromboembolic disease, and the PF ratio was low again. 
um, test X-ray was normal, um, but the echo showed that the RVSP was 52, and there was uh, RV dysfunction that was consistent with a massive PE. Bronc was clear, um, but on intraoperative pulmonary measurements, um, pulmonary artery measurements, the uh, PA pressures were up. Um, and there were also macroscopic clots that were extracted bilaterally on uh, anterograde flush and retrograde flush. So there's sort of multiple concerns with this donor. One is the thrombotic or embolic history. One is the elevated RVSP and the RV dysfunction. Uh, the heart was declined for these reasons. But the question is, is this acute? Is it just from the acute clot, massive PE? Um, or is this CTEF? Um, and that's really something obviously important because we would never want to transplant lungs with CTEF. So these lungs went to EVLP, um, and after the diagnosis, massive PE, uh, they were treated. So they were given all to place on the circuit, um, and it significantly improved the function. So the systolic pulmonary arterial pressure dropped, the PVR dropped, uh, and the mean PA pressure also dropped. So um, to a point where we felt comfortable proceeding with transplants. Another um, thing that EVLP allows us is to do biopsies. So in these lungs, they did a biopsy and had the pathologist come in and do a quick section, um, and they saw that there was no chronic vascular problems, so then again, felt even more comfortable to transplant. Um, I recently had another um, a patient who had an endobronchial lesion that was quite distal and wasn't, and it was actually a medical aid in dying patient, so didn't have a bronchoscopy prior to uh, withdrawal of life support or you know, made. Um, and then we found a tiny endobronchial lesion. And so because the lungs were on EVLP, it allowed us, allowed us to biopsy it, get the frozen section, and be absolutely sure that there was no problem before we proceeded. Uh, this is really a, a focus, and a lot of research is going into using donor lungs with infectious diseases like hepatitis C. So the, the problem with hepatitis C is that we get so many donors, like 1,000 donors a year in North America, and they tend to be young donors with fairly good lungs. Um, they are IV drug users, and you know some have a smoking history, but Sorry, um, but you know they're young, otherwise young, um, but they're not offered due to um, the chance of transmission. So we know that there's essentially 100% transmission if the donor is um, RNA positive, hepatitis C. Um, so a number of years ago, um, we did one case, um, and this was a patient who was rapidly deteriorating. So essentially, you know, very very sick in ICU, um, and we did a Hep C positive donor to the Hep C negative recipient. The lungs were placed on EVLP, and usually we do four hours of perfusion, but we did six hours. Um, and what we found is that the viral load did decrease uh, in the perfusate over time, uh, but despite this decrease, uh, the recipient still was infected with hepatitis C. Um, he was treated, and he's doing well a couple of years later. Um, but it sort of begged the question of, well, how, how can we prevent transmission rather than just transmitting and treating? So this is Marcelo's, something Marcelo's been working on, um, and uh, Basically, the idea is if we can um, inactivate the virus on the EVLP circuit, then we can potentially prevent transmission to the patient. And one of the issues is that, yes, we can now treat hepatitis C, but it's quite expensive. And in Canada, the drugs aren't covered unless they're in a, a study. So it can be a significant financial burden to patients. So ideally, we prevent the transmission in the first place. Um, so I'll try to see if I think it'll work. So this is the circuit. That's our typical EVLP circuit. But what's different is there's that little device there. Um, basically, it's an internal tube of quartz and then a glass tube around it and then sort of a protective um, barrier there to, to keep the light inside the tube. So what happens is that the perfusate goes through this and gets irradiated with the UV light. Um, and the hope is that, it, again, it inactivates the virus and prevents transmission. So Marcelo's lab recently looked at this and uh, recently published a paper um, and found that actually it does work. So um, looking at the overtime um, of EVLP perfusion with the treatment of the UV light, uh, there was a significant decrease in essentially eradication of active virus. So if you look, um, the green is the active virus, um, and you can see the top control, there's still active virus after um, uh, three hours, but then the bottom um, treated with UV light, the virus is essentially inactivated. Another indication, so you know, we've done um, pediatric DCDs. This was a three-year-old, and we were able to perfuse the lungs. This was the x-ray preoperatively, so a bit of concern in the right lower lobe. So this allowed us to use the EVLP for these lungs, even though it was from a three-year-old. Another indication is the uncontrolled DCD. So we've started this protocol um, in Toronto, and um, it's a little bit different um, in that we have to wait for family consent before we can do anything. So this was a 44-year-old donor um, who had a cardiac arrest while playing basketball. And there was this no touch until the family, after de death declaration, until the family consented. So that was about 94 minutes. 
As soon as we got consent from the family, um, the patient was reintubated and placed on CPAP and then proned. Um, and we took the donor to the OR with, at about three hours um, was the flush time. Those are the lungs after they were removed. Um, and they look great, but we placed them on EDLP, obviously, to be absolutely sure. Um, and this is the three-hour X-ray, so you can see it's fairly clear. And then that's the recipient X-ray um, in the ICU. So we know that EVLP is good for assessing and treating lungs, but the question is, should we use it for everybody? Um, you know, would you recommend EVLP for these lungs? 36-year-old donor, PF ratio is 400. They look beautiful. You know, the question is, should we be using EVLP? One of the big components is the cost benefit. So the cost of EVLP, excluding the capital cost, can be up to $70,000 per case. So that's really a significant amount of money um, compared to the $24 Coleman cooler that we usually use to transport the lungs with the cold flush. So, you know, when you compare the two, it's hard to uh, it's hard to go for EVLP unless we know that there's really a significant benefit for all these standard lungs. So, is there a benefit? Well, let's look at the data. Um, so, there have been two randomized clinical trials looking at these EVLP for standard criteria donor lungs. The first is the Vienna study, um, and what they found was that there were no significant difference in outcomes. So po post-operative intubation days, ICU, hospital stay, um, ECMO use, duration of ECMO, 30-day uh, survival and discharge. So there, they didn't find any significant differences. They also looked at PGD, again, a really important factor, um, and there were, again, no significant differences between the two groups. The second is the INSPIRE trial, and this is a little bit different in that industry was quite involved in the um, funding of the trial and then the, um, the design of the trial. Um, and there were some changes in the study endpoints mid-trial. Mid what they found that was that there was a significantly lower um, uh, rate of PGD within 72 hours uh, for the group that had EVLP um, for these standard criteria donor lungs. But what's interesting is that the incidence of PGD two to three at 72 hours, which is really the clinically relevant factor, uh, was the same. So they didn't find any differences. Um, they also didn't find any differences in uh, hospital outcomes. So uh, looking at ventilation time, um, ICU stay or, or hospital stay. And they didn't find any significant differences in, in survival. But if you look at the 30-day survival, there was a difference between the group that had uh, EVLP, which was lower um, than the group that just had the traditional cold static preservation. So I think in terms of EVLP for standard lungs, um, we, standard risk lungs, uh, we know it's safe, and I think we can be comfortable saying that, um, but I don't think we, we don't have any data that shows that there's any benefit to using EVLP for uh, standard risk donor lungs, um, compared to our obviously much cheaper uh, cold preservation. So currently, EVLP and lung transplant really is saving lives. It's, uh, you know, has, at least in our program, and I think everywhere, has really increased the amount of donor lungs that are available and used for transplants. Um, and right now, we're using simple treatment strategies, but they've really made a big difference. Um, but I think, again, one of the exciting uh, parts of EVLP is the fact that there's so much potential for the future. So um, all kinds of different uh, treatment and repair uh, to, again, to try to increase the number of donor lungs we have. Thank you. Thank you very much for this excellent overview. Any questions from the audience? Walter Gebetko, Vienna. Nice talk. Congratulations and congratulations as always to all the group for all the work you're doing. Um, in standard lung preservation, we feel comfortable with an ischemic time of eight to 10 hours. With, we know with EVLP, we can extend this even further. My question to you is, how long do you feel safe now uh, um, with EVLP to preserve a lung? And if I may ask a question for the future, where would you see the limits in several years from now? Thank you for your question. Um, you know, we, we also feel that there's, there's no concern with the longer uh, ischemic times. And, um, you know, we do have, you know, one of my colleagues, John Young, published a paper last year with the ischemic times over 12 hours. Um, and we have patients who have up to 24 hours of total ischemic times. Um, and they do well. So, you know, I think they're really, um, 
we, we haven't really seen a limit at this point. I think it depends on the quality of the lung. And if you have a good lung, then I think we've, we've shown that you can, um, it, it can really last for quite a number of hours. I mean, there shouldn't really be a reason to pre preserve lungs for 24 hours. Um, this was sort of an interest, like a different case. But, um, you know, I think uh, in the future, and what I know Marcelo's hope is uh, this elective lung transplant. So um, I think, you know, we, we don't want to perfuse lungs longer than we really have to, although if it gets to the point where we're doing uh, interventions that can really improve them, then that may, uh, you know, extend the preservation time. But for standard lungs, um, you know, I think uh, allowing a more um, elective uh, transplant practice is really the dream, um, and we're not doing these high-risk surgeries in the middle of the night, I think is really, th even that itself could potentially improve patient outcomes. What, what's the longest period of time a lung was ever on the rig and then used clinically? Usually we don't do longer than six hours. I don't know what the absolute longest is, but six hours is... is and, and the last short question with regard to the fascinating other applications of EVLB, especially hepatitis C, in view of the fantastic results also of the now effective uh, hepatitis C drugs, do you recommend in your upcoming trial that you're running, do you, are you using this in combination with hepatitis C drugs or are you, are you doing it in your trial without the drugs? No, we're doing both. So, um, but trying for, we're trying to adjust the protocol of the drugs. So, um, using the EVLP with the UV and then um, doing a shorter course. So, whereas we were previously doing 12 weeks, um, you know, working with our hepatologist trying to decrease. So, uh, we do, you know, one to two weeks of treatment afterwards, again, because it's such a financial um, burden on these patients and also because the risks with the medication, although low, but. Thank you, Laura. Thank you.